Um, so I always uh, joke with people whenever I speak, uh, when I tell them to come, you can ask Sebastian. Uh, I always tell people, bring a pillow and a blanket because, uh, you know, in case it gets boring, you, you could be comfortable while I'm talking. Um, but I thought, I don't really need to say that this week because I'm going to talk about money and that'll keep you awake. All right. So I think God has spiritually gifted me to uh, loosen people's wallets. I do it at work. I do it uh, when we're raising money for camp. And um, I'm never ashamed to talk about finances when I believe that it is the right thing to talk about and it's the right thing to do. So if you feel a little ruffled this morning, I apologize, but only a little because we're really looking at what God has said and uh, we're not looking at it of the lens of like, oh, this is Paul's opinion uh, or this is, uh, you know, Randy's opinion because he wants a raise. Um, thank you. Thanks for the laugh. Uh, <laughs> appreciate that. Um, but really, truly, this is what God's word said. And uh, it was interesting to, to study this passage, uh, being someone who grew up in the church, who's uh, my mom used to work as the church secretary. So uh, part of the finances that came into our home for most of my life came from this church. Uh, and then, of course, being the minister of worship and all of that stuff. So, um, but I've also volunteered in a lot of things, too. So I think, uh, hopefully, uh, please don't get mad, but uh, please uh, let God convict uh, your wallet slightly if he needs to this morning. Because I think it's important. Yeah? So, we are continuing on in uh, 1 Corinthians. Last week, Josh finished up with chapter 8. We dive into chapter 9. Just a refresh on chapter 8. Chapter 8 was Paul uh, with this kind of bizarre discussion about meat. There was lots of talk about meat last week, which is really funny. It started making me hungry, and I just wanted a burger. Um, but, uh, but I always want a burger. But, um, yeah, so there's this discussion, and, and, and it's really cool how he ends it up where he says, I would, I would not eat meat for the rest of my life if it's going to cause a brother to stumble. And that is, I think, one of the most powerful passages that Paul shares. And I don't get to really touch on it this week because it's really more Josh's sermon next week. So I'm just going to like prep you for next week a little bit because what Paul is going to talk about here, because it's very interesting, right? He says, I wouldn't do any of these things. And then this week he's like, hey, I have some rights. Okay, and he's, he is correct. He does have rights as an apostle, as a minister of God. But verse 15, he sort of flips it on his head. But just, you know, a little, if you want to read ahead. But yeah, there's, some, there's a couple of verses today that I'm going to kind of just skip over because they apply much more to Josh's sermon next week. Um, but they also echo what he was talking about last week and this idea of the freedom that we have in Christ to limit our freedom which is one of the weirdest things to say and to think about, but it's really something to ponder as believers because that's really what he's addressing in these couple of chapters is that we are free to limit the freedoms that we have in Christ and that we do that for the sake of other believers. It's pretty powerful. So again, sorry, that's next week. I apologize, but here we go. So let's look at our text for this week. So we're going to look at the first 14 verses of chapter 9. So let's uh, look at them here together. He says, uh, this is Paul. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I have no right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not consume some of the milk of the flock? I am not just asserting these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does the law not say these things as well? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle the ox while it is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking entirely for our sake? Yes, it was written for our sake because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing in the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Let's pray together. Father God, uh, some just really powerful and uh, just great scripture this morning that we get to dig into. 
And God, I thank you that it's not super complicated. It's a pretty simple message that Paul has for us and that you have for us. Um, But God, I pray that you would be moving in our hearts. And God, that you would be helping us to examine the way that we approach uh, funding the things that happen uh, in your church. And specifically, God, this morning, talking about Bethany of Montclair. God, not so much the big C church, but this little church right here. And God, I pray that you would be speaking through me this morning. God, that my opinions would not be coming out, but God, that this would be the truth that you have laid in my heart to share with your people this morning. God, that you would be praised. And we ask these things in your mighty name. Amen. So it's very interesting, as I said, Paul, he does a couple of things here. In this first little section, he kind of lays out this Uh, his credentials as an apostle, right? So these first few verses, he's like, am I not free? Am I not apostle? By the way, if I had a dollar for every, like, question mark in these 14 (laughs) verses, I could take some of you to lunch, right? Um, Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of rhetorical questions that Paul asks here, right? But he he lays this thing, have I not seen Jesus the Lord? You're not my work in the Lord. If I'm an apostle to others, are you not my seal of apostleship in the Lord, right? And it reminded me of uh, the last time that I spoke where we were talking about these divisions that were present in the Corinthian church. And there were people saying, oh, I'm a Paul, and I'm of Apollos. And, and I think that this continues to be a theme that Paul hits throughout the book of Corinthians. And I, I think in some ways, it is, it is a bit of a scolding for these people. Paul is the one that came, that spent 18 months in Corinth to set up this church in an extraordinarily difficult place to set up a church. It was not easily done, right? And he worked the whole time that he was there. He was a tent maker, uh, and that's, that was his trade, right? And so he didn't just like hang out and, and accept a bunch of gifts from them. He worked the whole time that he was there, and he set up this church, and then he leaves, and they're like, oh man, I'm Apollos' guys. And it's like, hey, am I not an apostle? Like, like yes, that is a special place, right? When he talks about this, specifically when Paul is talking about his apostleship, there are three qualifications that he's talking about. The first is to have been a witness of the resurrected Christ, okay, which means that he saw Jesus, right, resurrected. That's one of the qualifications for this apostleship, right, and we know that. We look in the book of Acts, we see that happens. He even addresses it uh, here. He says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And the answer is, Yes, you have, right? The second thing is to have been explicitly chosen by the Holy Spirit. In Acts uh, chapter 9, uh, if you look there, you see that the Holy Spirit comes over uh, Paul and he says, I have a job for you. There is something specific that you are supposed to do. You need to take the word out to the Gentiles, right? And number three, to have the ability to perform signs and wonders. In 2 Corinthians, uh, we see Paul say, I have performed many signs and wonders in your presence. Right? So he is claiming a very specific uh, role in the church. Right? And for them to forget, right? not that he's a celebrity, but he is someone who saw Christ. And he, he was, life was changed. He was, he, had the, uh, he was blind for a little while and these scales dropped from his eyes. And God said, I'm going to use you for this person. He's a tremendously special man, Paul was. And to forget that is weird to me. <laughs> Right? It's not that he's a celebrity, but he, he's the one that started this church. He poured his love and his, his faithfulness into this congregation. And he has to remind them, like, do you remember me? Interesting. And we're going to come back to this a little bit later. But um, it, he comes back again, and he reminds them of who he is. And, of course, in this, now he tar- starts talking about these rights that he is entitled to. Right? And we're not going to debate the whole apostleship thing. I'll let Josh handle that some other time. What's an apostle? Who's an apostle? Are they modern apostles? I forget about it. Okay, you're welcome. Um, yeah. So verses 6, verses 1, and verses 12b, I'm not going to really talk about. We'll let Josh handle them next week because it really is uh, it's a precursor to next week. But there's three different rights that he talks about. The first is in verse 4, and it's the right to be taken care of with food and drink. He says, do we not have a right to eat and drink? Yes, I think you do, Paul. You should be able to eat and drink. Right? I mean, it's, it seems silly, but of course he's talking about this in relation to where he'll get to with number 14. The second thing he says is that those rights would apply to his wife if he were to have one, if he was to take one along with him. Right? This time Paul's not married, um, but he says, do I not have a right 
uh, to, add, to take along a believing wife, even as the other apostles, right? Even uh, Peter was married. Cephas, Peter, had a wife, took her with her took her with him on his journeys. And he's like, D- don't we have a right to feed me and also my wife? Right, like, and again, it's like, yeah, these things make sense, yes. And then uh, verse 14 is really what he's talking about. It's kind of, it, it enwraps all these things together. So can you do the next one? Yeah, uh, he says, so also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their, their living from the gospel. And that's really what he's talking about, right? He means you should be, uh, if I'm a minister of the gospel, I should be able to make my living simply as a minister of the gospel. And if I bring my wife along, she should be able to have food and I should be able to provide for her off of what I make being a minister of God. Right? And, And I don't believe that he's talking specifically about the apostles Right? Because he mentions other people who are not technically apostles, right? Jesus' brothers, and he also mentions some other people. And so this idea is that there is a group of people in the church who minister. They do it full time. And it is the local church's job to make sure that they are paid. Because that's what Jesus said. That's what God said. He said, the Lord directed those who proclaim to get their living from the gospel. Now, I'm pretty sure... That most pastors, if they could be paid not by the church and still pastor, I think most of them would do it. I really do. But when your gift from the Lord and your calling is to be a pastor, it's really hard to then go do another job and then come do this. Because your heart and your passion and your gifting and what God has molded you to do is to bring truth to a local congregation and to shepherd a local congregation. And so when God puts that on someone's heart, their desire is to do that, and we would like to pay them to make that happen. Amen? I hope you would say amen, yeah? Um, And so he gives a couple of reasons, which we'll just go through really quick, because I think it's important. He doesn't just say this, right? In verse 7, it's kind of the natural way of things, right? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat his fruit? Who tends a flock and does not consume some of the milk of the flock? Right? He's like, when you do these jobs, you, there are little benefits that you reap from them. Right? If you have a flock of sheep, right? Some of the flock, I guess, as sheep, goats. Flock of sheep or goats. You get some milk from them, right? You go over and like, whoosh, get some right from the tap on a hot day. Get some nice hot sheep milk. <laughs> delicious. This is why I'm not a shepherd, right? But it makes sense, right? If you're a soldier, you don't have to like pay for all your gear, right? You don't like show up and they're like, okay, uh, how much money did you bring today? Well, I got uh, X amount of, oh, well, you can have this armor and we're going to give you a pistol. But this guy, oh, he's loaded, man. This guy, no, right? When you serve, you get these things. It's part of the service. It's part of it, right? Uh, verse eight, right? It's ordained on God. I'm not just asserting these things according to human judgment or does the law not say these things as well? Right? And then he couples that with um, this idea, uh, go ahead and go to the next one, right? about the, the ox. Right, You don't muzzle the ox while it's threshing. So when ox thresh, they like go around in a circle and they stomp on the grain and get all the chaff and it flies away in the dirt. But they, they let the oxen eat a little bit as they're working, right? Because that's, the, that's what God has commanded them to do. And he's like, is God talking about oxen? Well, yes. But no, he's talking about ministry. Right? He's saying those who do that, they, there are some benefits of that. The, the priests who would take um, offerings into the temple, they would eat of a lot of the meats that came from the offering. And FYI, those were the choicest meats, right? Because when you brought a sacrifice to the temple, you didn't get like your nasty three-legged, like one-eyed goat. And like bring that, right? It's like, Arr! right? No, you brought like the, the finest goat you had. I mean, like, it sounds funny, but they were eating, like, some prime choice cuts, fam, because that was part of the benefit of what they did, because they couldn't go out and and tend a flock and and be shepherds because they were shepherding people, but they still needed to eat, right? And so he he goes to that as well. It follows the Old Testament practice. I kind of got into this already in verse 13, right? And And then his fifth version is that this comes from the Lord, and I think it's really important for us Look at verse 14 one more time. To proclaim the gospel should get their living from the gospel. 
right? There's a great quote uh, from John MacArthur, and I was like, ah, I dig this. So I'm just going to read it to you. He said, the Lord's servants are to be supported well. There should not be a double standard applying to preachers, missionaries, and other Christian ministers, a standard that is considerably lower than that set for those laboring in the system of man. And this is his, his key point. He said, we should pay them as generously as is feasible and leave the stewardship of that money to them, just as we expect the stewardship of our own money to be left to us. Right? We should pay them as generously as is feasible. That's, that's a powerful way to look at how we take care of our ministers financially. Right? Are we, I think that's a, I think this is a great guideline. It's not biblical, but in some ways it is when you look at some of these points that he makes, right? So the question is, why do we care? We pay our pastors here, so we're good. Like Bethany pays our leadership, so good, right? But don't forget that the, the Bible is not just written for us, but it's written for the church as a whole, right? And there are many places where people are pastoring and trying to run a local church while they are working a full-time job. I remember when we went to uh, Idaho several years ago, we took the, the uh, high schoolers and junior highs up to do a uh, um, uh, Bible a VBS. The main pastor of that church was a construction, you know, a construction company, which I don't know if you know much about construction. That is, man, that's a lot of work. That's real early mornings and making sure things happen and working on weekends and all kinds of stuff. Oh, and also he was the pastor of this local church, right? I mean, wow. And I don't believe that he received a, an income from that church. I don't know how I feel about that because I feel like should be throwing some money down towards that pastor. Now, he may decide, no, I could do both. But they're, they're told to take care of their ministers there. This is what we're told to do, right? Are we setting our pastors up for the future? Do we help them for, our, for their retirement, right? Do we create a place where they have to die standing here because they can't afford to not do it? And I'm not joking. I worked in, when I first started teaching, I worked at a private Christian school. Private Christian schools pay their teachers bupkis, all right? And I remember I went into a meeting, and they said, hey, would you like to uh, uh, put money towards retirement or money towards health care? And I said, I, I got to choose? They said, yeah, you got to choose one or the other. I said, well, I'm going to choose some health care because I'm young, and I don't think I'm going to be croaking anytime soon. But I told the administrator, I said, you're never going to keep teachers here long term if you don't invest in them. If you don't tell them, we want you to stay here. We want to pay you enough money. We want to make sure that you can retire teaching at this school. Right? We want to make sure that our pastor is not like, driving up in his wheelchair. He's 87 years old because he's got to pay his bills because we paid him bupkis money the whole time and we didn't take care of their retirement and we didn't think about their future and we didn't say at some point we would like you to be able to step back and maybe do something else that you're passionate about that God has gifted you with but not having to have all this responsibility when you're really old and you're tired and you should be doing something else all right enough said okay all right high horse got off okay so I want to take this one step further because I think there's another issue and it's beautiful that it, it's Volunteer Sunday this week. Um, oh, shoot, I can't skip this. Oh, Randall, what are you doing? One step further, address a related issue. Where does this money come from to pay our pastors? It comes from our tithes. That's where it comes from. Yeah? It comes from the money that you put in the cute little white boxes in the back or that comes out of your bank account through the app or whatever. Right? So here's some questions for you to think about. The first one, are you tithing? Are you giving some amount of the income that God has given to you to bless the ministry of this church, to minister to the people who minister to you, to allow this church to be able to grow the things that it, do, it does? Or do you freeload? Because that's what it is. He says you need to give to the ministers. He's not talking about people who got lots of money. I remember growing up, my mom told me, she always instilled in, in my brother and I, she said, I always make sure that I tithe. I don't ever want to not give to God because God has always taken me through. 
when she was a single mom and she was raising two knucklehead kids, she still tithed because she believed that God noticed her sacrifice. And he said, I will take care of you, Bonnie, and I'll take care of your boys. And then he brought along uh, Coach Mike into our family to help that happen. But God is faithful. And if you don't allow him to be, he can't be. So if you can say, well, it's really hard for me to tithe, Randy. I don't think God can bless me. You are exactly right. It's really hard for God to bless you if you're not willing to sacrifice. Right? Um, do you tithe based on who it's receiving it? Do you tithe to this church? Many, uh, many people will give to uh, parachurch organizations, but they won't give to their local church. Right? They'll give to Wycliffe, or they'll get to uh, a, con- a group that feeds the homeless or, or takes care of somebody in Africa or whatever it might be, but they don't give to their local church. They say, well, I want to make sure that my money's really going to things that matter. If you've said that, look around this room, people, because this matters. These are souls that matter to Almighty God. Yes, he cares about all of those people, and there is nothing wrong with those, uh, those organizations. But we have a responsibility if we meet here, if we are a part of this family, to take care of this family. We have been told to. Read verse 14 again for the 12th time, right? This is what God has commanded us to do. Right? Be sure that those who minister to us receive our financial blessing. All right, so this is the other thing I want to say. I think it's more than just tithing. It's more than just about money. And it goes back to that, those first couple of verses for Paul where he's talking about his apostleship. He's talking about the fact, and even when he goes back with that, what I preached on last time, where he, he's kind of giving his, re-giving his credentials to this congregation and reminding them to simply appreciate who he is and what he has done, and the sacrifices he made for these people. And I think this is a really, really important thing. Do we appreciate those people who minister to us? And I know I've been hitting on money so much. I'm I'm, I'm walking away from the money part right now. And I'm talking about, do we pray for those people? Do we thank those people? Do we come alongside them and just say, man, I, I appreciate you doing it. Like, if you got kids in Awana, do you appreciate those people? I know what I was like as a child. I know what some of these people went through at this church raising this knucklehead right here. And I guarantee you they did not get the thanks that they deserve, okay? I don't care how many Sundays they stood those people up and said, great job, and gave them a Coke. Like, it was not enough, okay? Because I was a terrible child. That's Charlie, okay? Um, I lived it. I know what a knucklehead I was, right? But are we appreciating those people? When you drop your your babies off in the nursery, do you thank those people and say, hey, thank you so much. I get to go sit and listen to the word of God and let it hit my heart and I don't have to worry about if my kid's crying or they're hungry or they need to change diaper or whatever it might be. Your small group leaders who give up their homes or they come here every single week. Just the fact that somebody has said, I will do this every week, man, that is something you should be thankful for. These people who come up here and practice their instruments every week. I know you think like, oh, that dude loves playing that. He probably just loves this 24-7. No. I will tell you as a worship pastor, no, man. There are weeks you get up here, you strap that guitar on, you're like, I would like to be doing 7,000 other things, like sleeping. I hate this song, right? But you try to serve with a joyful heart. Man, I'll tell you, last Tuesday at 9.15 p.m. when the machine's not working and I just want to take a sledgehammer to it and just go home and go to bed, right? You're just like, oh. <laughs> it's so important to appreciate people and to tell them thank you and to encourage them. And I will tell you, my spiritual gift is exhortation, which means my, my whole being is about encouraging. That's what I want to do. I want to lift people up. I want to build them up. And I will tell you, do you know what encourages me? Hey, great job, man. Thanks for what you do. I appreciate that. Like, that makes my heart go in the best way. And I think most people feel the same way. And we hear it so little in the church, right? We take so much of the ministries of this church, of any church, for granted. 
We forget that people are sacrificing their time and they're coming even when they don't feel good or they got 70 other things that are weighing on them. They still decide to say, you know what, God, no, I've made a commitment to these, these children or to these people or to making sure that this music happens or making sure that people get fed or making sure that things are clean or making sure that any of number of these, I'm praying for people, right? They say, oh, I feel terrible. I'm having a lousy week, but I'm going to stretcher bears. I'm going to pray for these people who are, think are having a worse week than me. But do we tell those people, thank you. This is amazing to stand people and say together as a thing. And I think it's wonderful and I think it's tremendous and I think we should be doing it all the time. And telling people, thank you for what you do. I will tell you, as a worship pastor, there were years, there were times where people would come up just randomly and be like, hey man, I really love that song today. And I would like hold that, like a little piece of gold next to my heart. Because most of the time it was, oh man, can you, can you talk to um, the sound guy? Because it was really loud. Or, oh my goodness, like those drums just like reverberate in my ears. Do you guys even like these songs? You know what I mean? Like seriously, like 22 years of that, like it gets real old really fast. But when somebody comes over and they just say, hey, I appreciate what you do. Here, I'll tell you. I think Josh probably feels the same way. You know, just because we do this stuff all the time doesn't mean that we don't need encouragement. Like, I think that's what happens, right? Like, I've been a teacher for 28 years, okay? I still love it when somebody at work comes over to me and says, thank you so much. I'm like, oh, you're welcome. I've been doing it for 28 years. You think, like, get over it, Randy. I can't get over it. I still respond to it. You know what I mean? Some of us have been playing music at this church for over 30 years, and when somebody comes over and they don't say something negative and it's halfway positive, like, we rejoice. Like, it makes us happy. Because most of the time, it's, you know? Like, I remember when I was talking with Alan about taking over, I said, now, you are ready to be the most unpopular person at church, right? And he kind of laughed. I said, I'm not joking. I've done this for 22 years. This is a very unpopular position. You mostly just hear people's gripes. You think the pastor hears them, whoo, he ain't playing a song. Right? But I'm not just talking about these people. I'm talking about all the people. And and having that heart of gratitude. And I think that's part of what Paul is getting at when he keeps reasserting this idea to be thankful for the people that God has put in places to minister to us. If they're doing it full time, let's pay them ashamedly. If they're doing it as volunteers, let's pay them with as much thankfulness and gifts of, of, of just saying great job and attaboys as we make our way through this life. Right? A couple of things to think about. Are you quick to criticize or quick to compliment? Do you give grace or do you give grief? Be an encourager with your finances and with your words and with your actions. This is God's family. If there's one place in this world where people should feel appreciated for the things that they do for one another, it should be in this family. We should not take one another for granted. We shouldn't take a pastor who values God's word as deeply as Josh does for granted. I watch lots of pastors on my Instagram. I'm not even sure if those people have ever even cracked open their Bibles. They've certainly cracked open their pocketbooks But I don't know if they've cracked open their Bibles. But our pastor loves the word of God. And he loves you guys. And sacrifices a lot. I don't know how many phone calls this dude gets at 8.30 at night. Somebody got a thing, right? Now, if it was me, the iPhone would probably be vibrating on the counter. And I'd be like, tomorrow. But not Joshua. He'll pick that phone up and spend time with us. But let's remember that too. And does that phone call really need to happen tonight at 8.30? Is that problem still going to be there tomorrow at 9? Maybe we can wait. And say, I'm going to love him in a way to not bother him at night when he's at home with his family. This isn't that, that big of an emergency. I think maybe we'll hit this tomorrow. It's a great way to say I love you and I honor you. Yeah? So as we think about thankfulness, I thought it's so beautiful coming into communion. Right? Because communion, I think a lot of times when we, when we think about the sacrifice that Jesus made, that he made for us, we remember the sacrifice. But I think sometimes we forget to be grateful and we forget to be thankful. And 
I would encourage you this morning, when you, when you come up to take your communion and go back to your seat with it, there's three things to remember. First, God's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Right? We remember the love that God had, even while we were sinners. And we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, that even while he walked this earth with the cross hanging over him, and even though he was a sinful, sinless, perfect man, he still died for all of our sins. And that is something to be thankful for. And thankful for the Holy Spirit for at some point coming and knocking on the door of our heart and shaking us enough for us to say, God, I need you. I need you to save me. Three things to be thankful for as we come forward this morning. Remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, but to do it with a thankful heart. And say, thank you, Jesus, that, that I know that one day I'm drinking this, this uh, little grape juice, but someday... I'm going to be in the very presence of God. And we're going to have communion together and it's going to be way better grape juice with Almighty God. Amen? Amen. So let's appreciate our people, our ministers, and let's appreciate our God this morning through communion. Let's pray together. Almighty God, thank you so much for those who are in leadership over us. God, we thank you for our pastors. Thank you for Josh, his leadership, his love of your word, his love of each and every one of us. And we're thankful for Charlie and the way that he ministers to us. Thankful for Matt and the way that he ministers to uh, our young people. For Ashley, the way that she ministers to our kids. And God, for all those, for, uh, for John who stepped in for Alan as he's away. God, we're so thankful for all of these people. Thankful that you have brought them to this church to give their gifts to our little community here. And God, we rejoice with all of those who volunteer. And God, I pray that we would spend our time thinking about them, praying for them, encouraging them, loving on those people who give their time and their love in so many different ways. Uh, to our congregation. God, we are so tremendously blessed in this place. And God, I pray that we would not forget that. And Lord, as we come to our time of communion this morning, we just want to thank you for your sacrifice. Almighty God, we thank you for your love and of what you were willing to give up that we might have an opportunity to spend eternity with you. And Holy Spirit, we thank you not only that you came and you ruffled our hearts one time, but that spirit, you live with us each day, that you comfort us, that you convict us, that you inspire us, that you speak to our hearts. We thank you. God, we pray that you'll be glorified in the rest of this time we have together in your mighty name. Amen. Please come and receive uh, communion.